We are builders in the sense that one builds a family, a reputation, a life. Superficially, we are all different. We come from many religions, cultures, communities, and occupations. But all the same, we are builders. We all believe in working together to build a better world, and we are constantly putting that belief into practice. Within our lodges, we meet as equals, pooling our strengths to help each other as well as those less fortunate than ourselves. We belong to an organization with a long and distinguished history. We're inspired by our brothers, past and present. We respect one another, honor our country, and are always building toward a better future. We believe in the brotherhood of man, under the fatherhood of God. We are Pennsylvania Freemasons. Welcome to Pennsylvania Freemasonry. You are now brother to millions of Masons across the globe, a valued member of the world's oldest, most prestigious fraternity. Here in your lodge, you have won the highest respect and wholehearted support from your brothers. Unanimously, to a man, they've approved your candidacy. In approving your petition, the Lodge determined that you meet three essential qualifications. You believe in the existence of a supreme being. You are of sound and high moral character with an excellent reputation. You come to Freemasonry unsolicited and of your own free will. Over hundreds of years, our Masonic brothers throughout the world have used these same three criteria in evaluating the petitions of millions of men. These principles are at the heart of our organization, of who we are and what we hope to become. You are now part of a fraternal tradition that has long nurtured those values. It's a tradition with a fascinating history. But like so many organizations with a long and proud history, its origins are more a matter of theory than certainty. Here are the three most common theories. The associations or guilds of medieval stonemasons who built the great cathedrals and castles of Europe. The crusaders of the 11th through 13th centuries. The 18th century philosophers and mystics who tried to explain our world in ways that took into account both its spiritual and material qualities. The founders of Masonry felt a kinship with all three groups. It wasn't so much a matter of claiming a direct lineage as it was of identifying with certain qualities, ideas, and values shared by those earlier men. The stonework of medieval cathedrals was a powerful communications medium. It broadcast the highest aspirations of humankind and the magnificence of God. It was stonemasons who gave the great cathedrals both their literal and symbolic strength. The craft guilds of the Middle Ages um, originated in a time when there was very little literacy. Uh, a lot of uh, information was communicated by, by apprenticeship, by, by word of mouth. And because masons moved around quite a lot from building project to building project, there had to be some sort of a symbolism. There had to be some sort of agreed upon recognition codes, uh, handshakes, uh, secret sign, various uh, master's marks. For almost 200 years, between 1096 and 1270, eight crusades attempted to capture the Holy Land. The Order of Knights Templar was formed during the First Crusade. They had the special assignment of guarding the occupied territory. When the Holy Land was recaptured, the Knights Templar fled to England and Scotland. Their long journey home was brutal, and back in England and Scotland, they found themselves excommunicated from the church. To protect themselves, they created safe houses where members could find refuge and sustenance all in secrecy. Legend has it that the knights also disguised themselves as stonemasons and adopted the tools of the trade as symbols of their brotherhood. The late 17th century and the entire 18th century in Europe and North America was a fertile time for new ideas. Universal brotherhood, the theory of gravitation, the rights of man. 
Masonry, by being developed in the early 18th century, brings together the view of ancient wisdom, of, of learning beyond um, the surface. It brings together the scientific world, seeing the world as being mathematical, regular, and it brings together a vision of humanity meeting together in harmony. To some theorists, the pledge of modern Freemasonry to help a good man become better connects it to the 18th century philosopher's goal of transforming the weaknesses of human nature into virtues. Modern Freemasonry probably got its start in London, England on an early summer's day, 1717. It was June 24th, St. John the Baptist Day, when four lodges met at the Goose and Gridiron Ale House to form the Grand Lodge of England. It didn't take long before an enterprising brother, James Anderson, published an official guide to the fraternity, including its rules, procedures, doctrine, and a history of its origins. Anderson called it the Constitutions of the Freemasons. Meanwhile, merchants, ship's captains, and military officers brought Freemasonry to the American colonies. In 1731, the Provincial Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania became the first Masonic governing body in North America. A year earlier, the fraternity had been the subject of an expose of the Masonic ritual published in the Pennsylvania Gazette. The writer of the article and editor of the paper was Benjamin Franklin. Evidently, there were no hard feelings, for just a month later, the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania made the 22-year-old Franklin a Mason. Three years later, in 1734, Ben Franklin was elected to serve as the Provincial Grand Master and again by appointment in 1749. I fell in then with the Masons at Philadelphia. I had written about them in my newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, in 1730 or thereabout, and uh, within a year or so did petition to join the Mas Masons there, the Lodge of St. John. And I was then elevated over the course of time through the hierarchy of the Lodge and became meta master, forgive me, French. I became master of the Lodge and eventually grand master of Pennsylvania itself. Here again, another useful association for the common good. In my Masonical career, I have participated in the erection of several important Masonic buildings at Philadelphia. I helped to lay the cornerstone for Freemasons Hall on Walnut Street in Philadelphia in 1755. And earlier, when I was the Grand Master of Pennsylvania, I laid the cornerstone for our State House, that which is in Independence Hall in the late 1730s. Since then, the Grand Lodge has designed six great buildings, each one more magnificent than the other. And the most spectacular is the current one, which was dedicated in 1873. It's right in the heart of downtown Philadelphia, next to City Hall. The Masonic Temple in Philadelphia, headquarters of the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, is both practical and symbolic. Practical because it's a working place full of activity. Year-round, the fraternity's administration, including the Grand Master's office, conducts its business here. It's also a social and recreational center. Fraternal and public events fill the calendar. Some 40 lodges and Masonically affiliated organizations hold their regular meetings and other events here. The temple also houses a museum of Masonic artifacts and a library that attracts researchers from all over the world. The architect, builders, and decorators of the temple wanted it to embody the values of Pennsylvania Freemasonry, especially its reverence for the thoughts and deeds of great civilizations. To do this, they created thousands of visual symbols out of stone, glass, wood, plaster, metal, and paint. They even made intentional mistakes that would provoke the viewer to search for symbolic meanings. 
Everywhere in the temple, you can find diverse styles and elements united by their architectural treatment and by what they convey of the Masonic spirit. Ionic Hall, for example, is decorated in the ancient Greek style, recognizable by its distinctive columns. Ionians were great craftsmen. Their well-proportioned architecture represents a well-balanced, judicious life. The room's ceiling, with its vivid sun motif and signs of the planets and zodiac, symbolizes the universal enlightenment that we've inherited from the ancient Ionians. Another sun motif appears again and again in the Egyptian hall. The Egyptians revered the sun as the source of life and knowledge. It's a fitting symbol for our brotherhood, which also values the power of knowledge and celebrates life through brotherly love, relief, and the search for truth. This remarkable room is also a living textbook for students of archaeology and Egyptology. Members of the fraternity spent three years in Egypt studying the ancient civilization's art and architecture and then painstakingly applied what they learned during the 12 years it took to finish the room. Their scholarly dedication and craftsmanship were of such high quality that all the hieroglyphs have accurate meaning. The deep reverence for the past, the loving attention to detail, and the high degree of craftsmanship so evident in this room silently communicate the Masonic values of integrity, fidelity, and achievement. Renaissance Hall contains elements from many ancient civilizations, including pillars from the Greek city-state of Corinth. Its paintings of King Solomon, Hiram, King of Tyre, and Hiram of If celebrate the trio who played central roles in the construction of King Solomon's temple, which plays such a prominent role in our Masonic ritual. And the painting of St. John the Evangelist celebrates the patron saint of brotherly love as well as our Masonic craft. The great poet Goethe, who was also a Freemason, characterized architecture as music frozen in time. The Masonic Temple in Philadelphia plays a vast symphony of melodies, harmonies, and rhythms, all of which communicate volumes about the spirit of Freemasonry. Of course, it's not the temple or the meeting room that constitutes Freemasonry. It's the values and personal qualities of our members. Those values are embedded in the basic qualifications for becoming a Mason. Your belief in a supreme being, your sound character and exemplary reputation, and that you come unsolicited to Freemasonry of your own free will. These basic qualifications, although essential, are only the beginning. It's what happens after you become a Mason that defines who we are. It's mutual support, encouragement, camaraderie, inspiration, and above all, active involvement in your lodge. I think the thing that uh, describes Masons most is integrity. Pennsylvania Masons should indeed be proud of uh, being associated with uh, Freemasonry in this particular jurisdiction because of the long history, so because of the uh, very staunch dedication to the true and tried principles. I just see a lot of pride, a whole lot of pride that he belongs to this group of men that do good things for the community uh, all over the United States. That's just pride. I used to have so much pride in it. Mason is a person who does good works in his community because he is a Mason. He also is a Mason because he is the sort of person who does good works in his community. I do not know if the chicken or the egg came first. Everyone that I've come across in the entire fraternity across the state, and I've been in touch with literally hundreds if not thousands of Masons, is looking for one thing, and that's to help somebody else. Uh, we're a part of the community. We're fathers, we're husbands, we're, we're, we're brothers, we're, we're uncles, grandfathers, and we work, uh, we work in a community, we live in a community, and if we have been blessed uh, with some talents, then it's our responsibility that uh, we use those talents to better our communities. Those men are special because they are looking to the community where there are needs. They are looking out and putting other people first. Well, I really began my, my work on masonry, my research into the fraternity, 
um, solely as an academic project. I, I later found out that I had relatives who were Masons, I had a grandfather who was a Mason, but I didn't know that at that point. It was, it was an academic interest for me. I guess what I knew was that people didn't know much about the fraternity. And as I got into it, the more I got into it, the more I realized what an extraordinary institution this is. You know, what, a, what an amazing history, a rich kind of mixture of all sorts of things that, that have helped to make America, that have helped to shape, to shape this nation and to shape the world. But look you, hmm? we were leather apron men, craftsmen, hmm? and what you call the Masonical orders, huh? with all their panoply, with all their ritual, with all their mysteries, yet alone it is a craft, and thus important. I have found it to be important in my life, in the life of the community of Philadelphia, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and indeed, to countenance the activities in Paris with the Lodge of the Nine Sisters, important indeed even in the life of our nation, of personal and social and civic improvement, masonry has much to offer. We are very proud to call you brother. You're in good company. You join the millions of men who, over the centuries, have put their Masonic principles to work for the betterment of mankind. Any accomplishment, no matter how great, starts with just one step. We hope you'll take that first step. It's as simple as actively participating in your lodge. That's where the Brotherhood of Pennsylvania Freemasonry really begins.